Hello, uh, welcome to the jQuery 1.4, 14 days of jQuery event. Uh, here today to talk about jQuery uh, events and using events in the browser. Um, I've given this talk a number of times before and uh, I've usually built it as sort of an advanced talk. Uh, but the more I think about the whole topic and the more people have been talking about finding ways of organizing their JavaScript code, I realized that this topic is actually very suitable for much more beginner users. So today I'm going to give a talk that I've given before, build as an advanced talk, uh, but targeted at sort of the beginner jQuery user or intermediate jQuery user. So like I said, uh, usually this talk is called something like evented programming. So that already sounds like something crazy. It sounds insane, like perhaps you should go, go back to school or something before you can even read the blog post or watch the presentation. Um, I think that's intentional. Um, most of the places where you encounter evented programming these days are in languages that are very hard. Um, so for instance, there's actor-based programming in Scala. Uh, Node.js has evented programming and like what people usually do in Node.js is m messing with servers and like stuff like that. So if you look at their evented example, it seems crazy. But it turns out that uh, evented programming is not actually an advanced topic. Evented programming is what you do every day in jQuery. In fact, the reason why you use jQuery is because you already find evented programming to be intuitive. So this is an example of evented programming, right? You, you have a P, you click on, you find a click event, and then when it gets triggered, you say, you click me, right? And that's evented programming. The idea is you bind to an event, and when something else says that that event happened, you do activities. A standard way of uh, looking at this, so I'm just going to show you another simple example, is you have a select box with some options in it, right? And so here's an example where you have a select box, its name is name, and then inside there's a bunch of data, uh, so members of the jQuery core team, and you can see that uh, there's a data div called creator, and then there's a value of John Resig, and then there's two core people, Yuta Katz, Brandon Aaron, and then infrastructure uh, team, Mike Hostetler. And then underneath, you can see that there's divs with ID of creator, core, and infrastructure, and a little span there that says class equals name, and it's empty, and then it says is so awesome, wrote some code, or keeps, keeps the site up. This is like a standard thing where you just have something you want, and in this case, what you want is that if you select a person from the select box, you want to show the div corresponding with that person and fill in the span with the person's name. So it's like pretty standard. I do this sort of thing all the time. And the JavaScript code is uh, pretty simple. It's probably similar to stuff you've done. Um, I think there's probably clever ways to do this, but I sort of just did it the way I would do it if I was doing something quick. Uh, you grab the selected out of the attribute. Um, you get the div by saying div pound and then the data div out of that. And then you go find the span and fill in the HTML. And then you show the div that you want and you hide the siblings, right? So again, I'm not going to go into detail because it's not like a talk on introductory jQuery, but the idea is this is like pretty normal and this is also normal evented programming. Uh, you said, when the user changes the select box, I want to do a bunch of stuff. Um, so evented programming is important for a few reasons. The first reason is that the web itself is fundamentally evented. So a lot of people come to the web uh, fresh and those people are sort of thinking about the web the way I like to think about it. And then there's a lot of people that come to the web from a server-side perspective. And the server-side perspective is a fundamentally synchronous perspective, right? You get a request, some things happen, you return a response, and the browser gets a response, or the client gets a response. And that's actually fundamentally different from how UIs work, how the web works, right? In the, in the world of the web, there's a lot of things going on, and you have to listen to see, did the user click? Did the user move his mouse? Did the user hit enter? Right? And any one of these things could happen at any time, and you just need to, you can't, you don't have the luxury of saying, ah, I'm not going to say, did the user click something? And I'll wait for the user to click, right? Because what if the user types? So there's a fundamentally invented concept here, and that's already how you program, right? This is normal. This is, this is how you think about the web already. Events are also the language of user requirements. So an example here is what, the thing I showed before could be represented as when the user selects an item, show the associated div and populate the name from the options value. And you can see that the beginning of this is described as 
when the user selects an item. That's an event, right? Um, the way you think about the problem is there's a lot of things that might happen, and I need to describe all the things that the user might do and what should happen in response. And in fact, this is why you like jQuery, right? Because jQuery takes that requirement of when the user changes the select box and makes it really trivial to, to reflect that in code, right? Dollar select dot change function. The DOM is also fundamentally evented, right? The whole API for working with the DOM is just a series of events. So this is just uh, HTML5, there's a bunch of events, and the DOM itself is just this fundamentally evented place. And like I said, jQuery is fundamentally evented. So one of the reasons that jQuery really stood out really early is that it really embraced the idea of events. It said, we're gonna give you a function called click, right? It said, that's such a common thing to want to bind to a click or a change or a submit that we're just going to make those first class functions. And that's in comparison to other frameworks that still have like what well, jQuery has a bind function, but that's the only way to do it. And so jQuery very early on acknowledged that this is a core way of operating, core way of working with the web, and you can see a lot of, a lot of uh, events that are on the jQuery that come with jQuery and a lot of ways of working with them. So basically what I'm trying to say is that this topic is not particularly advanced. It's already how you think about the web. Right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you an example of how you can think about evented programming in a more advanced case where you don't have browser events to work with. And so that's actually the leap, the mental leap, is when you write normal code for the web, you have these browser events. The user clicks, the user submits, the user hits enter. Right. And so you don't have to do anything to handle those events. You don't have to do anything, sorry, to deal with the underlying reality of those events. You just say, when the user clicks, do this. Done. Right. But there's actually sometimes something else going on. So the example that I'm going to use today, I've used before in, uh, again, more advanced talks than this. Uh, the example is tabs. And the reason I use tabs is because tabs are a non-trivial application, right? It's not, it doesn't take four lines of code to write. It takes like 15, 20, something like that. Um, but it's also not so complicated as to let the complexity of the problem outweigh my ability to use it to explain. So tabs, I think, is a really good example uh, for teaching. But the ideas that I'm going to talk about here are actually pretty scalable to, to medium-sized problems. So the first way a lot of server-side people think about tabs and think about widgets is objects. And that's because they, this is an example of Ruby. They come from a language like Ruby where the normal way of operating is this. You make a class called tabs. You inherit from widget, you have some initialization, and then you have a method called select, and when you and it gets called with a tab and you do some behavior. Right? And the reason why this works so well is that the server side is a fundamentally synchronous place. So it's totally fine to have methods that have to do things and block, and you have other methods that call them, because that's all normal. That's the way server side works. And so a lot of people come to JavaScript and the first thing they do is implement something like this. Right, where they say, oh, I'll just do that in JavaScript. And it's great because it's really easy to do in JavaScript. Pretty much every uh, framework other than jQuery comes with an abstraction like this because it's really easy. And it looks a lot like what you may have already been doing in your server-side language. Right? And so there's Ruby-flavored ones and Java-flavored ones and Python-flavored ones. But what they all come down to is trying to take a model that works really well in a synchronous world and make it work in an evented world. But actually, that's not really the right way to think about it. And the way I would like you to think about the tabs problem is imagine, let's first start by imagining that there was a native tabs implementation in HTML. There isn't. There's, uh, despite HTML5 adding a whole bunch of new stuff, there's no tabs implementation. But let's imagine what it would look like, how it would feel to work with a native implementation of tabs. So here's how it might look, right? You, have, you might have a container called tabs, and then you would have a bunch of, uh, bunch of tabs, and they would have some attribute pointing at the content that they were part of, um, and they could have selected or not selected. And the idea here is that you would expect things like tabs.adder selected to work. You would expect it to kind of work just like a select box, right? You have a container, you have some things that could be picked, only one of them could be picked at a time. You expect to be able to ask for an attribute called selected, which will tell you, which will return the node that's selected. And you kind of expect that the same API as a select box, right? And so this is how you would expect it to work. Here's how I would feel like it would work. You would say $tabs.bind change. So when the tabs widget changes, then I want to first step one is get the selected element. So I'm going to do $this.adder selected, right? And then the pane is going to, so I've actually decided, I should have prefixed by saying, I've decided that if, I'm, if there's a native tabs widget, it probably will not come with a built-in pane system. It will probably say, 
we'll manage which things you can pick. You, like, we'll manage the fact that you can only select one at a time and manage the selectiveness, and we'll just give you an event for um, when things change, and you could decide whether or not to turn things on. So in this case, the pane is the div that has the ID that's in the data content of the tab that was actually selected. And then I go and I store the actual pane that I got in data, and I hide it. Um, sorry, I hide what I've already stored, and then I store the next one in the pane. So this is like, again, basic jQuery, right? It looks a lot like what you've already been doing, but you'll realize that you're missing something, right? There's no actual tabs widget. There's no change event. None of this actually works, right? But this is how you would like to think about the problem. Uh, you don't want to think about it as like this OO tabs widget thing. You want to think about it as though it was just another thing that happened to exist in HTML. And so let's look at how this might work in the real world. In the real world, you'll probably end up having to use real HTML. So you would have a UL with a class of tabs. And the, you'll use LIs. The LIs will have data content. Um, and instead of having selected equals selected, we'll say that the class is that it's selected. right? And we have the same div with panes and stuff like that. Um, what we would expect to have work is what we said we would expect to have work before is that the ul.tab should have an adder of selected. So just like we thought if there was be a native tabs widget, we would expect to be able to ask for the selected attribute, we want to be able to do the same thing here. And we want to be able to write basically the same code as we wrote in our hypothetical imaginary world, except using the real HTML element. So uh, bind to ul.tabs, uh, get the selected attribute um, out, of, uh, out of this, which is the ul, and then the pane is the same thing as we did before, and then hide and show the pane, right? So basically, the way we want it to work is exactly the same. But again, we're missing something here. And what we're missing here is what the browser normally does for you. So when you have a select box, you don't have to worry about the user clicks on the thing, and therefore you've selected something, right? The browser actually handles selecting uh, and triggering events and all that. In our case, we actually don't have the ability, we don't have a browser handling the native underlying code. But we still want to think about the problem from this perspective. Like, imagine this was the native thing. And so there's another step to this process. Step one is, imagine that this was native. How would this work? And step two is, OK, now we have to implement the part that the browser would normally do for us. And here's how that would work. Here's how it would look. Uh, you'll say, when you click on the tabs thing, the set the selected attribute to be e.target. So you say, whatever the thing you actually clicked on, put that in selected. And now that's available. Right now, that's available as the selected attribute. And then get e.target and add the selected class. Uh, go get all of its siblings and remove selected. So that means that only the, the selected one will have the selected class on it. And then you trigger an event called change. Because remember, we, in our imaginary world where everything was done by the browser, we bound to a change event. So now in the world, the part of the world where we're implementing the code that the browser would normally have done for us, we trigger that change event. And that is because jQuery doesn't really make any difference between native events that the browser makes and custom events that you make. So we're just making an event called change. And in the world where we're pretending the browser has done this for us, everything works as, as so. And in the world where we're implementing the browser part, everything works as so. Um, and, docu and when the document is ready, we actually want to trigger change. So that means that the f whatever you have said was the selected one is going to actually be selected and shown. And the really cool thing about these two worlds is that the two worlds don't actually do anything different than you've already done in jQuery, right? We haven't actually created any new paradigms. In the browser world, you're writing the same kind of procedural code that you would write if you were going to do it from scratch and you hadn't written a good abstraction, right? But where people get frustrated is they write the kind of code that you're seeing right now and they say, but I want to reuse this. I'm confused. I don't want to have to write procedural code. And the solution is to say, to lock it up behind as though it was native. So treat it as though it was the same thing that you have already done. The next step is to say, OK, so I just said, imagine that there's a tabs thing. Now what if there was native pane support? So what if panes were actually natively attached? What would that actually look like? And you can imagine it looking like this. Uh, there would be a tabs thing. And instead of having data pane, there might just be a pane attribute. And it has first, second, and third. And the panes. Uh, the panes are for a second and third instead of being div. So now this is like something that could natively exist. HTML could natively support this. And the really nice thing about this is that once we have pane supported, and let's say the browser knows that when you click on something, it should select the right pane. All, sorry, when the, the browser knows what pane is attached to which element, 
in the tabs. Now all we have to do is say, when you change the tabs, show, hide the panes and show the selected one, right? So now the actual code, imagining that there is some browser support for this, becomes quite simple. The real life of this is similar to what we did before, uh, where we have ul class equals tabs, and now we point at the data, and we use div class equals pane. So essentially, we've just slightly tweaked what we had before, and now, uh, so the reason I say real world and just showing you basically what we had before is to say that obviously there's no real HTML. There's no real support for this. So we're going to have to add it into our already existing model. But you can, the reason that it's nice to think about the basic model, though, like imagine there was HTML, is you can imagine how it would work natively, how it would feel, how you would be able to implement this if the browser just did it for you. And that's a very nice way to be thinking about these problems when you're just building stuff day after day. And the way that that would work uh, in the new case, in the case where you have the real world, is again you would have the adder selected and you would be able to do bind change just like we did in the imaginary world and say this.adder panes.hide, this.adder pane.show. So now what we're doing in real world in terms of the actual code that we're writing day after day once we've written the abstraction is basically identical to the code we wrote in imaginary world where the browser has provided this for us natively. We still have to implement the browser code. And again, the nice thing about the browser code that we're implementing is that it is very familiar to you. You know how to do $ul.tabs.click. You know how to bind to change and add classes and get siblings and remove classes, right? This is code that you're already familiar with. So what you've done is you've taken code that you're familiar with, um, t put it into one space, and then made it so that day after day you can write also code that you're familiar with. Uh, the only extra piece that's important here is that because of the fact that we're now supporting attached panes, when the document is ready, we actually need to go and assign an, an attribute called panes to the tab. So now the ul.tabs gets a list of panes attached to it, right? And we just go through it and we use normal jQuery functions to map over all the LIs that are inside of the tabs and get the pane that's attached to data-pane. Uh, and then we just go and trigger change. So. The way to think about it, I'll just reiterate again, is you want to think about it like this. You want to think about it as every day when I write code, when I'm building these hypothetical medium or large size apps that I'm worried about organizing my code, I want to write day after day code as though it was built in, right? I don't want to have to worry about building objects. I don't want to have to worry about subclassing. I don't want to have to worry about a whole new paradigm. I just want to write code the way I've always written code, the, way, the reason I got into jQuery in the first place. So you want to build an abstraction that lets you think about attributes, and binding to events, and then hide the information away behind code that is also like what you're working on. So you implement the browser code. That's, that's the way to think about it. Uh, thank you very much. If I had people here, I would have questions. Um, but thank you, and uh, it's great being here. And be sure to catch the rest of jQuery 1.4, 14 days of jQuery.